Uh, all of exam two is kind of like, what do microbes need for them to grow? So we're going to talk about in this whole unit, which I think your PowerPoint when I loaded it says chapter, six, chapter seven. Um, McGraw-Hill has done a revamp of their textbook and they changed chapter numbers. Uh, so it's chapter seven in your ebook. Um, but it's everything they need to grow. And also what do they do with some things that you know, would be toxic to them. So we're going to talk in this unit. I was going to say, I think it's my next slide. Um, what is microbial growth? What are some growth requirements, such as oxygen, other nutrients like carbon and nitrogen? What are some physical requirements, like certain temperatures? Um, how can we grow microbes? Because that's what we do in our lab all the time. Uh, how can or how do microbes grow? They grow exponentially. Um, and then how can we measure different ways of measuring microbial growth? The next PowerPoint that will start, because I don't expect to actually finish this one today. Uh, the next PowerPoint that will start on Thursday uh, also then talks about microbial metabolism, which is breaking down. So bacteria eat things just like we do, and they have to break everything down. And their metabolism is kind of similar to what our metabolism is, whereas we eat food and we have to break things down to get nutrients. So do they, but as their cells are way not as advanced as ours, um, there are some differences. So we'll start that PowerPoint on Thursday. So the next unit is just two PowerPoints, two chapters. So I wrote stuff up, so I didn't have to write it on the board. So first is talking about microbial growth. So it's like, well, what is microbial growth as we're constantly talking about microbes and growing? We're not talking about the microbes as they are growing in size. Like when we talk about us all the time, we're like, oh, you grew. Well, yeah, you were a little tiny thing, and then all of a sudden you're a big, tall thing. Uh, we don't generally talk about bacteria as a growing in their size. When we talk about microbial growth, we talk about them as a growing in numbers. So cell reproduction. So microbial growth is where one bacteria now became one billion bacteria. So not size, we're talking numbers. Colonies, we already started looking at colonies on those plates. You guys were counting colonies on your plates last week. Uh, a colony is a group of cells that arose from one single parent cell. So you guys swabbed whatever random surfaces you picked. You swabbed the plate. One bacteria landed on that plate and we made it super happy. And then it divided and divided and divided until it actually became visible because there were so many. But every bacteria that's in that colony all came from one single bacteria. Genetically, they're all identical. We're going to take a look at it in lab next week. Because um, not all the colonies look the same as each other, as we already started to see on your plates from last week. Some are big colonies, some are small colonies. Um, they're different colors from each other. There's lots of different ways we can describe what a colony looks like, because just what it looks like on a plate is a first clue on what it might be. The things that microbes need to make them happy so that they can grow and reproduce is they need lots of nutrients. In the top four nutrients, they call, they call it the fab four, it's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. These really are the top four elements that we as humans need as well. These are the top four elements that cells need, whether prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells. So they need carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, which we're going to talk about in our next few slides. They also need energy. It's got all the components. They need to be able to build stuff, make stuff. They need energy to do that. Is we can group organisms based on, well, where do they get their carbon? Because that's one of those nutrients, those elements that they need. And where do they get their energy from? So sources of carbon, organisms that can make their own carbon molecules. We call them autotrophs. Auto means self. If you drive an automatic car, it shifts by itself. You don't have to have a shifter. Means they have to eat carbon. They cannot make it on their own. They can't do it by themselves. So you either are going to be able to make your carbon molecules or you're going to have to ingest and eat the carbon molecules. Autotrophs or heterotrophs. Sources of energy, chemotrophs, that first part of the word chem is for chemicals. They get all their energy from chemicals. As chemicals start to break down, it releases energy, form of ATP, and they get all of their energy 
from that. That's how we get our energy. Is we eat food, it breaks down. Um, all those chemicals, as they start to break down, releases ATP. Phototrophs get all of their energy. Photo means light from the sun or from some light source. Now, based on how they get their carbon and based on how they get their energy, we can really smoosh these two words together on where they get their carbon, where do they get their energy from, and it tells us a lot about the organisms. Um, and so we can, as I say, smoosh the words together. If you are a photo heterotroph, photo means you get your energy from the light. Heterotroph means that you ingest all of your carbon molecules. You can't make your own carbon molecules. And it tells us a little bit about the organisms that can do that. Um, a photoautotroph, they get all their energy from the light and they can make all of their own uh, carbon sources. A lot of those are your plants. Generally, the ones that we care most about, because they're the ones that affect us, are the chemoheterotrophs. Generally, all the bacteria out there that affect humans are chemoheterotrophs. They get all of their energy from chemicals, they get from breakdown of chemicals, and they ingest all of their carbon molecules. So these are the ones that are going to cause us the most issues. So those are your, you know, the carbon. So again, there's the Fab Four, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Before I get to the oxygen and the nitrogen, the hydrogen, I don't even give it an entire slide. I give it this last little bo bottom part. Um, well, how do they acquire their hydrogen? So organisms that acquire hydrogen from organic molecules that also give them carbon are called organotrophs. Now, organic, the word organic, everyone's like, yeah, it means all natural. I get where they get that. Um, organic just means carbon-based. All living things are carbon-based. So it's really where they get the word organic when you think about natural. Uh, organic means carbon-based. So an organotroph means that these organisms are going to get carbon, but in that same carbon molecule, there's also hydrogen. Example. Anyone know the formula for glucose off here? because it's carbon-based, but it also has hydrogen in it. And so an organotroph gets its hydrogen from that same organic carbon-based molecule that also gave us its carbon. A lithotroph just has to get its hydrogen from something that's not organic, something that's not carbon-based. My example up there, hydrogen sulfide. There's the hydrogen that it can get, but it's not a carbon-based molecule. So it just gets its hydrogen from something that's not carbon-based or organic. Now, the oxygen requirement, which is quite a few slides on here, because uh, different microbes are very, very picky on how much and if they can use oxygen. So one of the words that I use quite often when I talk about things that bacteria need or require, as I use the word obligate, the word obligate means required. So if you are an obligate aerobe, it is required that you have oxygen. Because air, A-E-R, me, A-E-R means oxygen. So an obligate requires oxygen. If you were an obligate anaerobe, it means re you require no oxygen. It's like you are obliged to go one way or the other. If you're obligate aerobe, you require oxygen. Obligate anaerobe, you require no oxygen, which means these organisms would die in the presence of oxygen. Now, reasons why organisms can be obligate anaerobes is because oxygen in itself, like oxygen gas that's all around us right now, not toxic, it's stable, it's fine. That in itself is not gonna be bad for organisms. But oxygen is used in a lot of chemical reactions. And it happens that when oxygen is used in chemical reactions, this is just this nice stable gas that we're breathing, oxygen could pick up an extra electron. 
or it could maybe even pick up two extra electrons, which makes it unstable, and anything unstable can be damaging. because It's got extra electrons, so it's reactive. So toxic forms of oxygen, such as picking up an extra electron or two, is because oxygen is used as part of a lot of chemical reactions. Any microbe out there that needs oxygen knows at some point in its life, toxic forms of oxygen are going to get produced. While I'm breathing, you guys are doing this too all the time. That's why you've got you know, free radicals and perox uh, the peroxisomes. We use oxygen. Anytime oxygen is used in chemical reactions, toxic forms of oxygen are going to be present, and they can do damage. And if all you are is one cell, and you damage that one cell, you die. And so organisms that do use oxygen have to have things to try to repair themselves, to try to, you know, make these toxic forms of oxygen not so toxic anymore. Because um, otherwise they cause the damage to cells and kill them. My examples of toxic forms of oxygen, I was going to say superoxide radical, where it picks up one. Um, peroxide actually picks up two. This is the stable form of it. Um, or a single oxygen, you know, where it's just O, not O2. Unstable, it's not happy. So, oxygen detoxify these toxic forms so they don't die. One, if they have a superoxide radical, so let's say, aka it just has this one, this is their superoxide. It makes an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. Anything that ends in ACE just is an enzyme. So bacteria are like, oh, okay, yeah, I can make this enzyme. And then as long as this enzyme is around, and if superoxide is around, it neutralizes it. Peroxide, which is two extra electrons on it. It's like, oh, okay, so if this peroxide is around, um, it can make other enzymes. One's called catalase, one's just called peroxidase. Um, and these different enzymes can neutralize those toxic forms of that peroxide. Bacteria is not able to make these enzymes that detoxify oxygen. They are around oxygen. They will make these things and it will kill them. Which means those are organisms that are considered to be obligate anaerobes. So obligate, obligate anaerobes do not make these detoxifying enzymes. So if you put them in oxygen, they will die because the bacteria will use that oxygen. So they don't die immediately. And they will make these toxic forms, and it will kill them. So they have to survive in a zero oxygen environment because they do not make the enzymes to neutralize it. We don't always know when we're working with different bacteria. Are they aerobic? Are they anaerobic? Um, or are they somewhere in between? So we can actually put bacteria in media, um, in tubes. This doesn't always have to be on plates. And if bacteria are aerobic, they're going to grow at the very top where the most oxygen is found. And so on here it is. They've got a nice loose cap so that oxygen can get in. And if the bacteria are only living up at the top, those bacteria are aerobic. They're not going to live at the bottom of the tube where there isn't any oxygen because oxygen is not going to go from the air and travel all the way through that media. Anaerobes, again, it is required that they live in a zero oxygen environment. They don't make any of those enzymes. So they're not going to be found anywhere near the oxygen because they would have died. The only place you would find them is at the very, very bottom of the tube where there isn't any oxygen. Then they're happily growing. And so we could look at these tubes and be like, oh, only growth at the bottom. Oh, obligate anaerobe. Only growth at the top. Oh, you know, obligate aerobe. It requires that oxygen. But then we have a couple others that are kind of in between. One is called facultative anaerobe. These are organisms that can survive in oxygen, they can also not survive in oxygen. They can live in both environments. They do better with oxygen around. I always think, you know, the word facultative sounds like faculty. I'm like, 
we can do it all um, as teachers. So they can grow in oxygen, but you'll also find them down in that anaerobic environment as well. Most of them are up by the oxygen. Everything is with oxygen when it comes to chemical reactions. And then we got another group of organisms that are called aerotolerant. That aero just means oxygen. I know it sounds like air, like what's in the air around you, but it refers to oxygen. And aerotolerant, these organisms, as the name says, they tolerate oxygen. They do not use it. So they could care less that it's around. So they don't benefit from it being there. They're not harmed from it being there. They just tolerate it. And so they are uniformly found anywhere in the tube because they don't care if there's more oxygen at the top and no oxygen at the bottom. They don't use it whatsoever. They just tolerate it. There was one group of organisms I didn't have a picture for, though, um, and they're called microaerophiles. We talk about this in lab, too. The word micro, small, air, oxygen. And this file or fill, I like to break words apart, Phil means like. I've yet to ever have a student named Phil one of these days. Phil means like. So it just means these organisms like small amounts of oxygen. So they require oxygen, but they grow best if there's not a lot of oxygen. So where in the tube do you think they would be found? Yeah, right in the middle. Like they don't grow if there's lots of oxygen, but they don't grow when there's no oxygen. They'd be kind of just found hanging out right in the middle. And we'll actually work with a couple bacteria this semester in our lab that are microaerophiles. So we have to, we'll talk when we get to lab, but um, there are ways we can reduce the amount of oxygen in the environment so that they grow happier. Elements out of my, we already talked about carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and the last of the four is nitrogen. So there are some bacteria that can do what's called nitrogen fixation. They can take uh, unusable nitrogen and turn it into a usable form. An example of an unusable form of nitrogen is nitrogen gas. If you didn't realize you're breathing in about 80% nitrogen gas right now, are you using it for anything? No. Just inert. It's an unusable form. Um, it's not reactive. It doesn't want to react with anything, so it just hangs out and doesn't do anything. But some bacteria can take that nitrogen gas that's super abundant in the air and they can turn it into usable forms like ammonia or ammonium. They can use those forms for growth in different chemical reactions. And so it's not uncommon that bacteria have actually figured out that they can hang out next to roots, which is that's what this is showing bacteria hanging out with root systems, because nitrogen is a fertilizer. Plants need nitrogen as well. And although 80% of what's in the air around us is nitrogen, the plants can't use it, just like the bacteria can't, you know, most of them. Um, but some bacteria can take that, you know, inert nitrogen gas and turn it into usable forms. And so bacteria will hang out with plants and take nitrogen gas and turn it into usable forms that the plants can even use, aka fertilizer. And then the plants usually give the bacteria some type of food source, liquid source, um, that moisture next to it, protection. And so they both benefit um, if you can have my, uh, the bacteria hanging out next to the roots. Well, other elements that are you know, less common than your carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur are also two common elements. Um, it's not as common as the other four that a lot of microorganisms need. Some different organisms require some trace elements, magnesium, calcium, but they're not the top elements that they need. And then there are some bacteria that require certain growth factors. Um, a growth factor is just something the organism requires, but it cannot make. So it's like you have to provide it for it um, or it will not survive because they can't make us on its own. An example of this would be different vitamins make vitamins, but we need them. Um, bacteria also require certain growth factors. Um, one example, or a couple examples, NAD, I'm not going to talk about NAD though, um, and heme that are both growth factors. The organism can't make it, um, but the bacteria, Haemophilus influenzae, 
um, requires these different growth factors. So if we're going to grow it in the lab, we have to make sure we give it everything we possibly um, can so that it will grow in the lab. Nitrogen plants. Full requirements. And I am a big fan of Big Bang Theory, so there's lots of fun memes that end up in my PowerPoint. Um, one physical requirement that different organisms have is the requirement of a very specific temperature. Now, why they require specific temperatures is because if it gets too hot or too cold, temperature affects different parts of the microbe. For example, if you heat up a protein, you denature the protein. The example I have up there is an egg. When you heat up an egg white, first what color was the egg white before you heated it? It's clear. And then afterwards it's white. Can it go backwards to clear again? No. Um, this is what happens. When you add that heat to that egg white, uh, you went from clear to white, you denature the proteins that were in there, and unfortunately, you cannot go back. It ultimately damages the cell. The cell, cell membranes, just like we do, and they're lipid-based. When you heat up a lipid, it's like when you heat up butter. It softens, and if your outer membrane is made up of this lipid, and now it's super soft and liquidy, things get in that shouldn't, things get out that sh shouldn't, and it can kill the organism. If it's too cold, have you ever tried to cut butter straight out of the freezer? Like almost in. Um, when it gets too cold, it becomes very rigid. It can become brittle, and you don't want a, your outer cell membrane to become brittle that things can't move around that should move around. And so temperature affects the lipids in that membrane, and it also affects all the proteins in the microorganisms. So if it gets too hot or too cold, it's not good for the bacteria. So microorganisms generally all have an optimal growing temperature. Now, organisms that live in us, their optimal growing temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Why 37 degrees Celsius? Temperature. So they figured out like, hey, we, you know, our body is like their optimal growing temperature. They're going to grow like crazy, multiple like crazy. That doesn't mean they won't grow at alternate temperatures, give or take a little bit, but they're not going to grow as well. So this is just showing bacteria, same bacteria on three different plates. It's going to grow best at 37 degrees Celsius. But there will still be some growth as you get colder. As you get colder and colder, it's going to be less and less growth. It's away from that optimal growth temperature. This is one of the reasons why I even say, you know, if you have a fever, should you immediately start taking things for, your, you know, your anti-fever meds? Now, I mean, obviously, if you have a fever like 105, 106, you may want to go in for that. But if you have a slight fever, it's not always the worst thing if you can survive it not to take something. Because if you are out of that optimal growing temperature of the bacteria, the bacteria are not going to be reproducing as fast, and your immune system can get rid of whatever is there. That fever takes organisms out of their optimal growing temperature. Most of the organisms, not most, all of the organisms that affect us are all considered mesophiles. Meso just kind of means middle or moderate. Um, these are going to be the organisms that grow best at body temperature right around that 37 degrees. But there are other microorganisms that are out there, that don't affect us, uh, that grow at different temperatures. Things that like warm temperatures are called thermophiles. That therm means heat or temperature. They're going to grow best around 70-ish degrees Celsius. There are some called hypothermophiles that grow best at boiling temperatures. Boiling does not kill everything. Some organisms will grow in boiling temperatures. So I'm like hot springs, and I'm like even super hot springs, still organisms growing. The opposite, there are some organisms that grow when it's still cold, and they actually like cold temperatures. They're called psychrophiles. I always think the psycho sounds like psycho, like it's, you're crazy if you like cold temperatures. But there are some organisms that need cold temperatures to grow. Um, this picture, I think, is on my next slide bigger. <laughs> 
that, although this is a picture taken in, Art in Antarctica, and these are algae, but there were red algae. So it looks like, oh my God, the snow is like bloody everywhere. It's not, they're just a red algae. And this particular red algae is a psychrophile. It requires cold temperatures and it grows best on snow, on freezing temperatures. These things will grow best. Now, organisms that live in us are mesophiles. If you put a psychrophile in us, is it gonna grow? If you put a thermophile or a hypothermophile in us, is it gonna grow? No, so generally we don't care about them quite as much uh, just because we're not their optimal growing temperature. There's sometimes tiny little overlap that usually means they can get in there. Our immune system will get rid of it before they would ever reproduce. Um, but they're not gonna cause us issues. So we don't care about it. Another requirement that organisms have is pH. And a lot of that is because of either too much hydrogen ions or too little hydrogen ions also affect how organisms grow. PH, if you didn't know, stands for the potential of hydrogen. The H is capitalized because it's hydrogen. And if you are acidic, which means you have lots of hydrogen, like excessive amounts of hydrogen, the more acidic you are, the more hydrogen ions you have. The more alkaline or base, basic you are, the more hydroxide ions you have. And depending on how many hydrogen ions or how many hydroxide ions, it causes issues with different types of bonding. It causes issues with different types of chemical reactions. So something too acidic or too alkaline causes issues. So most organisms that uh, live in us have a neutral pH. Do you guys remember? What is the pH of blood? Seven point two to seven point three, somewhere in there. Our blood is slightly alkaline, but it's still right around neutral. Um, and that's our the optimal growing pH of most organisms. That means some organisms can't tolerate pHs out of that range. You know, they would prefer a more neutral pH, but they can survive environments outside of that. So most organisms like a neutral pH. They're called neutrophiles. Again, that fill means likes. So it likes neutral environments. There are some organisms that are called acidophiles. Again, like a more acid environment. Even though I don't know if I would like to say they like acid, but they can tolerate it. Where in our body is an acidic environment? Which part though? Stomach. Um, our stomach is extremely acidic. Most bacteria. So even if you're like, hey, that food dropped on the floor, I'll just pick it up and eat it. Most bacteria that are now on that food die once they hit the stomach and that really um, strong acid. But there are some bacteria that can still tolerate that acid. This is also why the bacteria that causes stomach ulcers has figured out how to tolerate that acid environment. It will survive and grow um, and thrive in our stomach. It doesn't use the acid, but it tolerates the acid. Alkalinophiles, again, they like an alkaline environment, so they like a more basic temperature or basic pH. And this would be areas in part of our, uh, our small intestine, because right after the food leaves the stomach, you know, right when it hits the small intestine, we just, you know, start neutralizing um, with lots of hydroxide ions, all that acid that came from the stomach, and it usually has a slightly um, alkaline environment. So depending where it is in the body, different organisms can be found. Um, and again, it's, they just have to figure out how to tolerate that acid or alkaline environment. But most, they'd prefer neutral if they could. Organisms do require water. They require it. Like, there aren't any organisms that require no oxygen. Main reason why water is considered the universal solvent. It's going to dissolve everything. And it's also part of a lot of metabolic reactions. When we get into our next PowerPoint, talking about metabolism, water plays a role. We will see water in those different chemical reactions. So if organisms require water, what happens to organisms when they don't have any water? 
really great way to control microbial growth. So it's like if this table is dry, are organisms thriving and growing like crazy on here? No. Um, which is why generally dry surfaces aren't big carriers of bacteria. So even if bacteria landed on it, as long as no one else has touched it in a while, as I've been touching it, um, the bacteria are not going to survive for very long because they're going to dry out. So what happens or how do some cells survive in drier conditions? Because that doesn't mean there aren't any bacteria on here right now. There are bacteria can dry, survive dry conditions at least for a short period of time. One, they try to have a nice wall. Um, bacteria that have a thicker wall can sometimes survive those drier environments. Again, it's just like if you had the wall of a building, it's going to prevent water loss. Membranes can prevent water loss. It can make it so water, that any water does not leave those cell membranes. And if you're really lucky and you're a bacteria that can make an endospore, those bacteria could just go dormant. And those are the ones we do have to have an issue with because I can sit here and touch this table all day long and all the bacteria on my hands, because we know there's bacteria on hands, can be touching this table. Luckily, generally, the bacteria that are all over your hands do not form endospores. Um, and if I don't touch this for a while, all the bacteria I just put down are going to die. However, if it is a bacteria that can form an endospore, it could survive on that surface for long periods of time, um, even months, that someone could then, months later, come around and touch this, and you know, they touch their mouth, um, and that bacteria can then get in the body and start to grow again. So it allows them to survive in dry conditions for even longer if you can make an endospore. Then there are some bacteria that require a very specific osmotic pressure. When we talk about osmotic pressure, what are we talking about? Where does the osmotic word come from? What happens in osmosis? Moving of what? Water. So in osmosis, water always wants to go where there's not as much water. Um, and this is what we're talking about in salty environments. If you drop a cell, we'll just say it's a bacteria cell, in a very salty environment, water's going to want to leave that cell and go into that salty environment because water wants to go where there's not as much water. There's a lot of salt, there's not a lot of water. Now, that could mean if you dropped a cell, a bacteria, into a salty environment, all the water will leave the cell and it will shrivel up and die. Generally, that's what happens. Um, it's one of the reasons why we can even use salt as a preservative is because we know if we put lots of salt all over stuff, it draws the water out of the bacteria, and the bacteria shrivel up and die. However, some bacteria figured this out um, and have adapted to salty environments. So using salt is not going to stop everything from growing. The Great Salt Lake and the Dead Sea have a super high concentration of salt, and there are still microorganisms that grow just fine. They don't shrivel up and die when you put them in that salt environment. Things that can survive salt and sometimes even like salt, they're called halophiles. Anything that has that halo in it means a salt. It's like they like salt. Sometimes they require salt. They're obligate halophiles. They require a high salt, low water environment. And some are called facultative. They can live there. They don't live there. Like we have microorganisms living in the ocean. That's salty environment. They don't care. They survive. And the last, the last of my physical requirements is some organisms require a very specific hydrostatic pressure. Now, what movie? Nemo. Where are they in this particular scene of Finding Nemo? Okay. Bottom of the trench. It's been a long time since I've seen it too. Um, way at the very bottom of the trench. This is where you have an extreme high pressure. Like you have... We're going to say this circle is my cell. You have so much water pressure pushing in on that cell from every direction. Most organisms cannot survive that super high water pressure. That's what hydrostatic pressure is. If I took this cell from the bottom of the trench, and these are microbes that are, make it glow, um, but if I took this cell at the bottom of the trench that has adapted to the super high pressure, it requires the super high pressure, and I brought it to the surface, this thing's good. the thing would explode. 
Like it's meant to sit there and withstand the pressure. And if the pressure's not, not there holding it together, it will explode. So if we're working or studying organisms that are found at the bottom of the ocean that have adapted to that really high pressure, if we were to study them, we would have to study them in a super high pressure environment. We'd have to replicate that scientific pressure in a lab. Luckily, our bodies are not this pressure, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, the organisms that grow and cause us issues do not require that super high hydrostatic pressure. There are some organisms that do. Now, some organisms also like to hang out with other organisms and to the point that they form very specific associations with each other. So any type of organism, um, well, I want to say not any type of organism, antagonistic relationships means two organisms are living together. One always benefits at the expense of another. It's called antagonistic, like they're against each other. Like the antagonistic or synergistic? Only because I think I reword them in a different way. No, only because I'm like an antagonistic relationship. I know I have it later somewhere. Um, is generally also called a parasitic relationship. So, no, I wouldn't ask you specifically in this unit because I don't think I talk about a parasitic relationship for a while. Um, but organisms where one benefits at the expense of another, they're parasites. Just, you know, anything that's going to cause harm. A bacteria, when it lives in us, it benefits at the expense of us. Just a relationship that's opposite of each other. One benefits, one doesn't. Synergistic relationships, these are also called commensal relationships. Um, it just means every organism that's in that grouping benefits. Biotic relationships just means organisms that are always found together. Beneficial. Sometimes it's not. It can vary day to day. My biggest example for symbiotic relationships are the relationships with you have with your family. Can you change your family? No. And I'm like, they're your family. You are in a relationship with that family, whether you like it or not. And you know, it's a, you're always found living with that family. I know you might have moved out, but living with that family members. Sometimes it's a good relationship. Sometimes it's a bad relationship. Sometimes it changes day to day. But it is considered always a symbiotic relationship. So when organisms are always found together, symbiotic. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. We're going to talk about this one a couple, like in a week in lab, too. Um, organisms that are found together, again, most often if they're found together, they do usually benefit, uh, are called biofilms. The word bio means life or living. Film means a covering. So a biofilm is a covering of bacteria or living organisms. So it's a whole bunch of organisms living together that are covering surfaces. So they are living together. There's usually multiple bacteria. How they can stick to each other and stick to surfaces. They use slime layers. They can use the little fimbri that look like cilia, but they're meant for sticking. And I know I've got more slides on this, but the biggest example that we're going to focus on in our lab this semester when I talk about biofilms are the microbes that are sticking to your teeth right now. Whether you realize it or not, you have bacteria all over your teeth, which is why we're going to scrape your teeth and look at them in like a week. Um, but bacteria are going to stick to your teeth. They use fimbria. They use slime layers. Um, they're going to stick to your teeth, and then they will start to stick to each other. And as they start to stick to your teeth and stick to each other, they will actually form a protective coating. Um, that's benefits. But they start to form a protective coating because anytime you drink water, that could potentially rinse them off, and they don't want to get rinsed off. I mean, your mouth is a warm, moist environment, and you constantly are putting food in there to feed them too. 
I mean, it's like the best environment for bacteria to live in. Um, so they don't want to get rinsed off. So they do make like a sticky matrix. If you've ever gotten to the end of the day and you scraped your teeth and they're a little furry, while allowing those bacteria to stick to your teeth all day long, which is why we brush our teeth. Um, if you allow that sticky matrix to harden, now you got plaque on your teeth. Um, but it's, so it's, if you drink any water, it just flows off the surface of those bacteria and they don't get rinsed off because you've got this wonderful sticky matrix um, adhering them to it. Benefits that the organism get by forming this nice biofilm and sticking together and sticking to surfaces. Um, one, it allows them to stick to each other and it's strength in numbers. It allows them to attach to a surface. One bacteria itself might not have been able to attach to the surface of the teeth, but it might have been able to attach to that bacteria or to that bacteria, or even attach to some of the sticky matrix that's there. Bacteria can't reproduce until they first stick and form, I mean, you know, find a home. So allowing them to find a home is beneficial to them. It allows them to get more nutrients sitting there eating whatever you're eating, drinking whatever you're drinking. And it protects the individuals because now they are protected in that nice sticky matrix. Um, toxins can't get to them as well. Um, food and water aren't, isn't going to break them off the teeth as easily. Um, even to the point as they start to make this sticky matrix, the sticky matrix actually is like a signal for other bacteria to come to it and stick to it. It's called quorum sensing, that these microorganisms in this sticky matrix will send out chemicals to be like, hey, we found this great home, come join us, strengthen numbers, um, and it attracts other bacteria to it. Again, I know our lab is in the morning, so in theory your teeth won't be super gross. They will be. Um, but you got bacteria all over your teeth, and we're going to see some of them um, in lab. Trying to remember what day. It's two weeks. So, as the microorganisms are sitting on there, they do become more harmful. Bacteria cause cavities. Everyone's like, no. I was told as a kid, sugar causes cavities. Not really. Never get a cavity as long as you didn't have bacteria on your teeth. When bacteria hang out on your teeth, and you feed them sugar. The only way bacteria break down sugar is through a process called fermentation, and they will produce acid as a byproduct of fermentation. So you could eat sugar all day. If you didn't have any bacteria on your teeth, but you do. If you didn't have any bacteria in your teeth, sugar cannot cause acid by itself. It's the bacteria that are present that break that sugar down that causes acid. So when they say, you know, at Halloween, ah, oh, sugar causes cavities. Bacteria that eat the sugar cause the cavities. Which is why if you brush your teeth all the time and remove as much bacteria as possible, you don't have that sugar. Now, things that you eat and drink can also trigger cavities as well. Um, sugary beverages, um, one, have sugar, which feeds the bacteria to produce acid. But a lot of sodas also have acid added into them. If you look at the ingredients, there's some type of a acid put in there. Um, so if you drink something that's sugary and acidic, well, now you are feeding bacteria to make acid and it has acid in it itself. Um, it's like a double whammy for your teeth because that acid wears away at the enamel, causing your cavities. Now, one of the biggest ways that we are trying to stop cavities from being formed is well, how can we just stop biofilms? How can we stop the bacteria from sticking to our teeth? If bacteria don't stick to your teeth, are you going to get cavities? Not likely. Again, if you drink acidic foods um, or acidic beverages all day, yeah, yes, you could. But if you could stop the bacteria from being in our teeth, you ultimately could stop cavities from being formed. And it's one of the best ways that we're trying to now stop uh, cavities is let's prevent the biofilm. Let's take the bacteria out of the equation. Green microorganisms. If we want to grow them, because in our lab all semester this semester, we are going to be growing or culturing microorganisms. There are some things that we have to give them and do for them. 
um, and different ways we can grill them up as well. So how do you grow organisms? One is we take an inoculum, which is our initial sample, and we introduce it into a medium. So some type of fluid or auger that's meant to grow that particular bacterium. So you will probably see and hear the word inoculum and medium this semester. So inoculum is that initial sample. When you were swabbing your phone or whatever else you swabbed, that really was your inoculum, and you introduced it into a medium, you introduced it onto that blood auger plate. That medium, that's the media, that's all the nutrients that are meant to help grow whatever was present. Now, there are different types of specimens on where we can get that sample, that inoculum from. Environmental, clinical, and stored. We're really only going to focus on one this semester. So environmental samples is I could go out and get a sample. I can get an inoculum from the river. I don't know if I always want to know what's growing in the river, but it's frozen over anyways, right? Um, but I could go get a water sample. I could get a soil sample. I can get a soil um, any type of sample from a lake, a river, a pond. You know, Mike, I could go out into the environment and get samples and test it. We're not going to do that this semester um, because we're going to focus mostly on clinical uh, specimens. And clinical specimens come from patients. And for us this semester, you guys are the patient. Oh, we're going to have fake patients. Well, a clinical specimen is a, is a sample that comes from a patient because we're looking to ID what organism is present. And then stored specimens are ones that we've already identified. We just keep them frozen for use later. Um, originally, they had to have come from somewhere, so they probably came from a patient or an environmental source. But then we've kept it around. So at some point this semester, I think even on Thursday, we're going to give you a broth and be like, half of you I guys are going to be working with E. coli, and half of you are going to work with Staphylococcus epidermitis, those bacteria that we're going to give you in that broth culture had to come from somewhere. And it's because we have stock cultures in a freezer that have these bacteria frozen for us to work with. Growing or cultivating microorganisms is just called culture. So, like, I hear lots of like, funny things. The only culture people have is, in micro is growing microorganisms. Also, we're going to be talking about what's known as a colony forming unit. It's, I like to think it's just a long way of saying a colony. It just means the bacteria that are there, because it's a colony, are all composed of cells that all came from a single progenitor or in a single original cell. So all the bacteria that are in this particular colony right there all came from one cell that landed. What we can also do is we can take all the bacteria from this one culture and we can plop it onto another plate and grow those up as well. They did all originate from one single parent cell or one single progenitor. A lot of times when we're seeing a colony forming unit, we're really counting colonies. It's like how many parent cells landed on the plate? Well, we can count that based on how many colonies formed from those parent cells. Everything we do in lab, we try to have aseptic technique, which are all the different ways to try to reduce or eliminate contamination. So we want to grow what we want to grow, and we don't want to grow anything else. We've got lots of different ways to try to do that, by spraying tables off before and afterhand, by not having the plates open to the environment, by making sure we've got gloves on, um, we're going to use, make sure anything we use to pick up bacteria is sterile before we do it. Like these are all things to reduce contamination. Now, two different ways we can grow and try to get isolated colonies so that we can see exactly what it looks like. We want to know what size, we want to know what shape. And one of these we're going to do on Thursday in lab is the streak plate. I've got, nope, just this one slide. Um, the streak plate is, you guys are going to have a broth of bacteria, and it's going to look, you know, kind of almost thick, because there's just going to be, like, trillions of bacteria in that fluid. But we don't know what that fluid is. I mean, we will. Um, but we don't always know what that bacteria is, and we want to know exactly what its colony looks like. So we have to go from, like, a trillion bacteria 
down. We have to reduce the concentration to the point where we can start to see isolated individual colonies. So we can see their size, we can see their shape, we can see their color, we can see any other features. And so we're going to be using the loops that are at your table on Thursday. We're going to pick up some bacteria from that broth. We're going to put it on one small area of the plate, flaming your little loops. We're going to drag some of that bacteria over to another side of the plate and streak it around a little bit. We'll flame the loop to make sure we kill anything that's on there. And we'll re keep repeating that. Because every time you spread the bacteria out and then kill everything that's on your loop and then go back and pull a little bit to another section, you're reducing how many bacteria are, are in that next section and in the next section and in that last section. So ultimately, we'll have reduced the number of bacteria to the point where we're going to be able to see individual colonies. And we're going to do this quite often this semester as well. Another way we can get down to isolated colonies is called pore plates. Instead of taking that broth and just picking up some bacteria with our loop, we could take that super concentrated broth and we could dilute the broth out. We can say, all right, well, I know this broth has got a lot of bacteria because it's very cloudy. The more cloudy, the more bacteria. I could start to dilute the broth out in one to 10 broth increments. And when I think I've diluted it, where you're like, oh, it looks pretty clear. I don't see anything in there. You could start to pour some of that broth right on the plates until you get to a low enough concentration where you see individual bacteria. We don't do this, mostly because that goes through a lot of broth tubes. And we don't always know at what point it is decreased enough uh, that you would see individual colonies on plates. So you have to go through quite a few tubes and quite a few plates. Um, and for us, we get the same results of seeing isolated colonies just by doing a street plate. We're good. Now, different types of media that we can use to grow. So we have been using blood augers. Um, again, they do have red blood cells in them, which is why I call them blood augers. The word auger has to do with the fact that uh, the thickening agent that makes it thick, like jello, comes from a red algae. Now, although it comes from a red algae, that's not what gives it the red color. <laughs> like all augers that give it that nice, thick, kind of jello like material, all come from the red algae. It just has a thickening agent in it. We'll work with a couple other augers this semester that don't have red blood cells in it. They still are coming from that same red algae. And although we have a huge variety of different types of plates, tubes, broths to grow bacteria in our lab, most bacteria, most prokaryotes have not been able to grow in a lab. I mean, we're going to work with a lot um, of different types this semester. But just know, there are so many microorganisms out there that we've yet to be able to reproduce a broth or a plate or any kind of auger that reproduces the exact combination of growth factors that that organism needs to grow. So we have lots of ways we can grow organisms, but not everything can grow. Um, there are sometimes we have to even use animals. That's on one of my slides coming up. Um, certain animals we know can grow different organisms. I have to grow the animals keep them alive and then grow the bacteria to study. One of the tubes we'll use this later this semester are called slant tubes. Um, purpose for a slant tube is we again don't always know if a bacteria is aerobic or not. We don't know if it needs oxygen, we don't know if it doesn't need oxygen. And so we can grow them on slant tubes because a slant tube does easily provide them two different environments. Bacteria will grow really well up on the slant if they like oxygen, because they're right there, easily exposed to lots of oxygen at the surface. If bacteria grow down in the bottom, which is called the butt of the tube, uh, we know that they're a more anaerobic environment because there isn't any oxygen that gets down here or very little oxygen gets down here. And what's nice is like we can use these slant tubes, we can put bacteria on here, we can look to see where the bacteria are growing because usually, there's usually a color change to the media where the bacteria are growing. So we'll use these later this semester. My last slide. Of culture media. Um, one, defined media. A defined media is known, means we know exactly what's in there. We've got a recipe that's like, all right, put five grams of glucose. You know, put two milliliters of red blood cells. 
from this particular animal. Like we know exactly what's in there. Like exactly. Now as depending on what we put in there, sometimes some stuff breaks down over time and sometimes we want it to break down over time. And that gets to be what's known as complex media. Is we've added something in there knowing that it will start to break down. And as it breaks down, it's breaking down into other types of elements and compounds that organisms need. So examples, yeast, beef, soy, blood, and milk. So a lot of protein type things can break down into various amino acids, and those amino acids then become used by the different organisms. So it's complex because we don't know at any given moment well, how much of it's broken down. Like we can't go back in and analyze exactly. We just know that it breaks down into the different amino acids if it's a protein to get used up. Elective media, we're going to work with this semester, so you'll see some of these definitions again up in lab, uh, contains a substance that either favors or inhibits growth, but then it has no effect on something else. I think I've got more slides coming up, and I'll start right here on this slide on Thursday. But it means we've added something to the media that we really don't care about. We don't want to grow. For example, it's probably one of my next slides. If I want to know if a patient has a fungal infection on their skin, I can do a skin scraping and I can put it on a plate. But we also know there's bacteria all over our skin and I don't want to see the bacteria on that patient's skin. I just want to know if there's fungus from that sample. We have plates that it can inhibit any bacteria that will grow. So bacteria are not going to show up on the plate. Instead, the only thing that will grow is fungus. Because the bacteria are inhibited, but the fungi are, fungi are not affected whatsoever. So it's called selective, because we're really selecting for a type or group of organisms to grow. Differential is we add a substrate. And if the bacteria can do something with that substrate, we're going to get a color change. So I always think differential is because it's going to look different we're going to see a cool color change. If we ask enough yes no questions, can the bacteria break this down, yes or no, you know, we would know it by a color change, we can again help identify the organism. And then we have something called transport media. That's not meant to grow the organisms. It's just meant to keep them alive. So when you take a sample from a patient and you send it down to the lab, we're hoping that whatever bacteria were on that sample that you collected or in that sample, that same number of bacteria are still alive when they get to the lab to help identify it. So we don't want to grow the bacteria. We don't, we don't want the 10 bacteria you collected from your patient to all of a sudden be 10 million bacteria by the time they get to lab. And people, the lab people are like, oh my god, they got raging infections. But we don't want them to die either and then misdiagnose the patient. Transport media is just meant to keep the patient sample alive, to keep the bacteria alive in about the same number until they can get to the lab for analysis. And we're going to start right there on Thursday. <laughs>